Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Well, today I'm going to do something a little bit different. And if you've looked at the runtime on this, the show is a bit longer than it usually is. But you're not going to listen to me rant the whole time. I am going to tell you and then give you a prime shining example of how and why medical care is so fracked up and expensive in the U.S. I can, however, answer the question, why is it fracked up, in just one word. Government. About a century of it. See, a hundred years ago, medical care was both affordable and comprehensive. You could pay for it out of your pocket without going broke. Now, one of the ways this was done was through fraternal lodges. Now, these don't really exist much today. If you have watched old Flintstones and you've ever seen, you know, Fred and Barney talk about their lodge, that's what they're talking about, is a fraternal lodge. It's kind of the remnants of it. By the 1960s, they were pretty much on their way out. They didn't do what I'm about to say about the doctors. The best known ones that are still around today are the Freemasons. Those are still in existence. In fact, one of their halls, this is a Freemason meeting hall. It's behind me. Don't believe the Freemason conspiracy theories because they're all just insane nonsense. Um, the other ones who are around the top logo is theirs. The bottom one, that is the Shriners. And the Shriners are basically best known at this point for the Shrine Circus that they sponsor. And they're largely disappearing as well. So the way this worked was fraternal lodges would directly employ a doctor. And the annual membership fee that a member paid would allow them and their family to see this doctor at any time for any ailment at no charge. In fact, most of the time, the doctor would come see them. Now, at the end of any given year, the lodge members would then vote whether this doctor was any good or not. And if they said yes, they kept the doctor. If they say no, they got a new one. And this meant, because there was competition, that doctors weren't getting paid all that much. And so doctors petitioned government to outlaw those fraternal lodges offering that service. And so government being government, they were more than happy to stick the camel's nose into that tent, and boy, did the camel come in. That was just the beginning. For the next hundred years, government got into everything, including wage and price controls at various times. They had and still have essentially regulated the free market out of health care, out of medical care. There is none. There's no free market, not really. My father, interestingly enough, he was a psychologist with his own business practice. And in 1978, he got his first business computer. I'm going to go into some of the specifics of this just for kicks. He had gotten into tech about 10 years before when he'd made a little bit of a splash in psychology by using a computer for part of his doctorate. And that's because he needed to crunch a whole bunch of numbers. Now, today, we just use like a spreadsheet or a calculator or something like that, a good one scientific calculator, to crunch these kinds of numbers. But back then, it was painstaking. You used what was called a slide rule, which you see here, and a lot of paper and a lot of brain sweat. If you do not know what a slide rule is, count yourself lucky. Put it this way. I'm not going to explain how one works. It's too complicated. I know because I lived through the tail end of it. Um, but a slide rule basically was a way to come up with some complex calculations with some level of accuracy. But nowhere near as accurate as if you get a good scientific calculator program for your phone. So what my dad did was he partnered with a guy who was in the computer science department at the same university he went to. This other guy in computer science got his doctorate based on writing the programs that my dad needed to crunch his numbers. You have to remember, too, this was back in the era of the IBM mainframe being king. And these things were enormous, as you can see on there, and could not do what your cell phone can do. I always like to say we have more, every one of us, in our pockets. We have more computing power than it took to put man on the moon. And this was also uh, when we used punch cards for computer input. Not terminals, not monitors and keyboards and mouse, but punch cards. And that's what you can see in this lower picture. I think my dad still has some of the punch cards, or did, he passed away. And 
my parents' house in the basement. I'm not sure anymore, but he used to. Um, if you never had to live through this, you know, punch cards, count yourself lucky. I, I barely missed them. I barely missed them in computing. Because I, I don't, people who don't know, I was in uh, IT for about 40 years. I barely missed these. So, in 1978, my dad got his first business computer. It was very early, pre-personal computers, because they didn't start until the 1980s. And you're seeing here the best picture that I could find of it, which wasn't very good. It is the Ohio Scientific C28PDF computer. It is not compatible with any other computer, okay, before or after. Um, what you're seeing just for kicks here, the box on the left, that is the CPU. That is something that today is this big in your computer, potentially smaller. And uh, it was made up of transistors and resistors. Um, it, and it certainly was nowhere near as powerful as anything that we have today. Again, in your pocket, you have more computing power than it took to put man on the moon. The second box on the side there, that is a pair of 275 K floppy disks. Yeah, yeah, you, you heard me right. 275K. Not gigabytes, not megabytes. 275 kilobyte floppy disks. So my dad using this, he wrote a lot of his own programs in the basic programming language, and he did that to streamline things, to customize things to work for his particular needs. And he thought, ultimately, that this was going to make his life easier that it was going to make his office more streamlined and more competitive. Well, as I said, I was in IT for 40 years. And many years after he got that, after I'd been working in the industry for quite a while, he told me that the only thing computers, then and up to my, long after in the PC era, the only thing that computers ever did for him was to allow him to keep up with government regulations because they kept adding so many new regulations every year that he needed the computing power. You could no longer do it with pen and paper. There's so many regulations. It wasn't that way when he started out. There were so many regulations by the 80s, 90s, 2000s. You had to have this computing power or you couldn't keep up. So, that is where we are today with a mess that we call health care. It isn't really medicine or medical care, it's actually insurance. If you want to make medical care cheap again, get government out of it. Repeal every single law dealing with medicine, drugs, and insurance. They are unconstitutional anyway. There is no language in the Constitution that would authorize the federal government to be involved in medicine, drugs, or insurance in any way. So under the 10th Amendment, it is a uh, power reserved to the states of the people. Once you get government out of it, medical care will become comprehensive and affordable out of pocket again. When we have a free market, it will become affordable and out of pocket. And GPs will be making house calls again which, by the way, is something they did as late as the 1970s, early 1970s. I remember it myself. And you can see it if you watch the TV show The Brady Bunch. They occasionally have doctors coming out to do house calls. And that gets into why this episode is going to run long. Because I'm going to show you a very specific episode of the TV series Dragonet. <clears throat> now, Dragnet was the very first police procedural. Um, I'm mostly going to let it speak for itself to begin with. I would notice one thing, however, in addition to what you're seeing here on this show. As late as the 1970s, early 1970s, the show would portray if there had been like a murder and there was a wife involved and she might get, you know, kind of um, distraught. They would call the family doctor to come to their home to administer a sedative to the wife. Now you should be aware it wasn't, wasn't always wasn't always women. Um, they sometimes doped up men too, but you know, women were more common. Let's be real. It was the 1960s, 1950s. What do you expect? So what I'm going to do today is show you this episode of Dragnet. It's called The Big Thief, and it first aired on December 19th, 1953. It is an entire show whose plot 
absolutely hinges on the way that doctors commonly worked in the early 1950s. I would particularly note the one house call that is to a complete stranger, but involves a baby being delivered. And remember, the story you're about to see is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. And it really is as true as you can get for a TV series. Dragnet dramatized real LAPD cases and producer slash um, creator slash star slash oftentimes director Jack Webb was a real stickler for details. He actually employed two LAPD detectives as technical advisors. Uh, sometimes he dramatized their cases that he had personally, they had personally solved. Now I'm going to let it pretty much speak for itself. But be aware that when you're looking at this, you're going to find that the structure of this looks pretty familiar to you. And that's because Jack Webb, with this show on radio to start with and then on TV, he invented the police procedural genre, the whole thing. He invented what you're about to see. It's going to look familiar to you because you've seen it a million times since, because for the last 72 years, <laughs> they have been ripping off Jack Webb. So let us sit back, relax. We will watch this episode. And if you want to stay through all the way to the end, I will come back and do some non-healthcare related uh, trivia about Dragnet because I'm a big fan of this show. So let us sit back, relax, and enjoy Dragnet, the Big Thief. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was Wednesday, June 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery division. The boss is Captain Didion. My partner's Frank Smith. My name's Friday. We'd gotten a call that a doctor had been slugged in a downtown hotel. The assailant had escaped. We had to find him. Six p.m. We reached the hotel at the corner of Pembroke and Columbia Streets. We talked with one of the officers in the radio unit that answered the call. He told us that his partner was out checking the neighborhood. We talked with the ambulance attendant, and he told us that the cut on the victim's head was not serious. The victim identified himself to us as Dr. Aaron R. Platt. We asked him what had happened. That's hard to answer, sir. It's hard to tell you what happened. I'm not too sure about it myself. If you'd tell us what you do know, sir. I received a call tonight that a woman was ill. Who'd the call come from, Doctor? It came through my call service. What time was this, Doctor? Well, it must have been about 7.45. My call service would have a record of it. You can get in touch with them. You ever seen these people before? No. So you want to tell us what happened? As I told you, I got a call from my service. Gave me this address and the room number. What did your call service tell you? Just said that a woman needed a physician. I came right over. All right, would you go ahead? Well, when I came into the hotel, I checked with the room clerk downstairs and asked about Mr. and Mrs. Allen. He told me they were in this room. Allen, huh? Mm -hmm. That's the name they gave me. Mm -hmm. I came up, knocked on the door, and Mr. Allen opened it. Huh. I don't suppose that's his real name to you. Well, we'll check on it, Doctor. Be a little silly to give the real name and then do a thing like this. Yeah. What happened after the man let you into the room? Oh, I told him who I was, and he said that his wife was ill. Where was she? 
lying in the bed all covered up. I went over to her and asked her what was wrong. What'd she say? Nothing. She moaned a little. Then her husband, I guess that's who he was, told me that it was her side. Said that she'd had a pain all evening. Yeah. He asked me if I thought it might be appendix. I told him there are a lot of other things that cause pain in the side beside appendix. Mm-hmm. I went over to the bed to take the woman's temperature. That's when the man locked the door. Sir? I heard this noise. I turned around and saw the man turning the night latch on the door. I asked him why he was doing that, and he told me he didn't want us to be disturbed. At the time, I, I thought it was a little strange, no reason to lock the door, but, but he had a reason. He had one. Yeah. After that, I went over to the woman again and reached out for the thermometer. All of a sudden, she jumped up out of bed, jumped at me. I turned around and asked what this was all about. And I saw the man, he had a gun standing right behind me. And I saw him start to swing the gun, and then... Well, that's the last I remember until I came to. I called the police, that's it. You never saw these people before? No. No, I remembered if I did. Do you have any idea why they'd call you? No. No, the man said something to the girl on the board of my call service. You can check with her. Oh, I wonder if I could have a cigarette. Sure. Thanks. Could I have my coat, please? Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Well, that's funny. What's that, sir? My lighter, it's gone. Solid gold, present for my wife. I'd hate to lose that. <laughs> the top opens up when you spin the flint thing, you know? Yes, sir. How about your other personal effects? What was that? Your other effects, doctor. Your wallet, your money. <laughs> gone. Gone, everything. The thieves, they robbed me. That's what they did. I don't mind the money, only $30, $40, but the cards in my wallet. Rotten thieves. Look here. What's that, sir? My watch. They even took my watch. Automatic. It was a good one. My wife gave me that, too. Can you give us a description of these articles? Well, I certainly can. I've got the case and movement numbers at the watch in my office. I can give you that. You want a complete description of the man and woman, too, doctor? Well, I gave one to the other officers. Yes, sir, but we'd like to go over it with you. Oh, all right. Say, wait a minute. Yes, sir. My bag, do you see it? What's that, sir? My doctor's bag. Must be in the room someplace, unless they took that, too. Just sit still, doctor. We'll look for it. Joe, here it is. I thought he wouldn't touch that, doctor. Oh, I want to see what's in it. you mind moving some of those things, please? Sure. Uh, instruments are all there. That's what they took, all right. All of it. What's that, doctor? Narcotics. 8.59 p.m. We got a complete description of the pair of suspects, and Frank and I called them into the office. R and I had no record of anyone by the name of Timothy Allen answering the description that we'd been given. 9.03 p.m. We talked to the desk clerk. He was unable to give us any information on the pair. He said that the couple had come in earlier that evening and had paid for the room in advance. He went on to say that they carried one piece of luggage. We looked at the registration card. It was signed with the name Mr. and Mrs. Timothy Allen and gave us an address, St. Paul, Minnesota. The registration card was held as evidence to be checked by Don Meyer in handwriting. We called the crime lab and a crew of men were sent out to go over the hotel room for possible physical evidence. 9.27 p.m. We went back to the office and got out a local broadcast and an APB on the pair of suspects. A radiogram was sent to the police department in St. Paul asking for information on the couple. 9.27 Dr. Platt was asked to come to the office and go through the mug books. A call was put into Narcotics Division to see if the officers there had any information on the thieves. Officer Roxy Lucarelli said that he checked their files to see if he could come up with any leads for us. In the meantime, the stats office had started to run on the M.O. used in the crime. You got anything? No, Roxy's going to check it. Says he's never heard of the man and woman. They're new to him. Yeah. How about the numbers on the vials? Yeah, there's a broadcast out on them. They'll be listed in the Mars bulletin. Dr. Kaufman in? No, he's still checking. Well, if he doesn't find him, we can take him over to crime analysis. Maybe have a composite drawn up, huh? Yeah. Hot shot. I'll get it. I got it. Frank? Yeah? What is it? Hotel on West 7th. Yeah? Another doctor slugged and robbed. <laughs> p.m. We arrived at the scene of the latest beating. We talked to the victim, a Dr. Aubrey Baker. The story we got from him was substantially the same as the one Dr. Platt had given us. A call had been put out by a man who gave his name as Allen. 
saying that his wife needed immediate treatment. Upon the doctor's arrival, the door to the room had been locked, and the doctor had been beaten and robbed of his personal effects and supply of narcotics. The description the doctor was able to give us was the same as the one we'd gotten before. 10.47 p.m., we talked with the desk clerk at the hotel. The description he gave us of the Allen couple matched the one that we had. A check of the registration card showed that the handwriting was the same. We spent the rest of the night running down the leads we had. The stats office had come up with four possibles. They were checked out, but they netted us nothing. For the next two nights, Frank and I stayed in the field in the hopes of apprehending the pair of thieves. During that time, they hit three times. All of the victims were doctors. Each time, the entire supply of narcotics was taken. Monday, June 22nd, 10 p.m. Frank and I checked into the office. There was a message that Captain Didion wanted to see us. Hi, Joe. Frank. Kipper. Heard from St. Paul yet? Yeah, I got a radiogram about an hour ago. I got no record on the pair back there. How about the operation? New to them. Mm -hmm. How about this deal you set up? You want to go over it? Yeah, the way we got it figured, this couple's new. Either they just got into town or else they just decided to get a piece of narcotic action in town. Where'd you get that? We talked to Roxy Lucarelli over at Narcotics. Yeah? He's talked to the other fellows in the office. None of them have heard of this kind of operation before. It's new to them, too. Uh -huh. How about informants? The couple are selling the stuff. There's got to be some rumbles around about it. Well, it doesn't seem to work out that way, Skipper. Roxy says they haven't heard anything about it. This Allen couple must be building up a supply before they start to unload it. Yeah. We had the artist over at Crime Analysis drop a composite picture of the couple. It's been sent out to all the doctors in the area. When did it go out? Mailed over the weekend. Should have happened this morning. Who'd you send it to? All the general practitioners, internists, physicians, and surgeons in the area. Got a list of names from the AMA. They're going to give us all the help they can. We sent out about 1,500 of the osteopaths in the area. They're going to cooperate. Uh -huh. Waysmith tells it whenever one of these doctors gets a call to a hotel and it's not a regular patient, they're going to call you. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. And then we can get in touch with the clerk at the hotel and get a description of the people making the call. The doctor waits for us at the desk, and if the couple looks like possibles, well, we go with them. Looks like the long way around. Yeah, that's about the only way we got, though. How many men are you going to need to help cover it? One other team should do it. Uh, you're only going to roll on the calls where the description matches? Yeah. Okay. Rafferty and Murphy will work with you on it. Be a team out of the business office if you need any more help. In case, cover. What are you getting from narcotics? Well, they got four men on it, running down leads on the dope. They got the serial numbers on the vials. The way Captain Shy tells it, they try to push a single cap of the stuff and they'll nail them. Well, looks good. Hope it works out. Yeah, so do we, Skipper. Robbery, did he, huh? Yeah, just a minute. For you, Friday. Thank you. Friday talking. Yes, sir, yes, that's right. Who's speaking, please? Dr. Adams? Yes, sir. I see. What's that address again? Yes, I have it. Do you have a phone number? Fine. 416? Yes, sir. All right, we have it. Yes, we know where that is. Right, that's correct. Right. Thank you. Bye. Well, looks like it started. What do you got? It's a Dr. Adams. We'll know in a minute here if it means anything. Hello, this is Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. Yes, that's right. Do you have a name on the couple in 416? Mm-hmm. Could you describe him for me, please? No, no, there's nothing wrong. Now, just give us a description, would you please? Mm-hmm. And the woman? I see. Okay. Right? All right, thank you very much, sir. No, no, it's all right. Bye. Right. Bye. How about it? Name's Alden. Description matches. Checking with the desk clerk at the hotel and talking with the doctor who had made the call, Frank and I went up to the room. The doctor went into the bedroom to see the woman patient. Frank and I talked to her husband, Kenneth Alden. Sure is nice of you fellas to be here, but I don't think there's any reason for it. It's all right. I should have listened to Helen. She said we shouldn't have come. Where are you from, Alden? Alden. Huh? I said, where are you from? Uh, Carthage. Missouri? Sure hope everything's all right. Yeah, Missouri. Either one of you know this Dr. Edmondson? No. Sure hope he knows what he's doing. Helen's kind of little, you know. Frail. Sure hope he knows what he's doing. How long have you and your wife been here? A week. A week tomorrow. I should have listened to Helen. She didn't think it was a good idea to come out here. I talked her into it. Said we should have a vacation. 
she was right. I don't know what I'll do if it's not all right. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you can say that. It's not your wife. I've been through the same thing. Yeah? Yeah, twice. Let me tell you, not a thing to worry about. Maybe not in a hospital, but here, a hotel room. I don't know. Believe me, son, it's going to be all right. I wish you'd let us know what's happening. Twice, huh? Yeah, boy and a girl. Helen wants a girl. Don't make much difference to me either way. Did it make a difference to you? Not really. I was kind of glad the person was a girl. Yeah, it'd be nice. But just as long as it's healthy, that's all that really counts. Awful quiet in there. It seems like we should hear something pretty soon. Take it easy. Yeah. I always thought they had to boil a lot of water. It seems like they always use a lot of hot water. I think that's to keep the husband busy, don't you? Give him something to do. Yeah. How old are yours? Girls eight, boys six. Oh, I read where that's ideal. Two years difference. Kind of helps the younger child problem. Helen and I want four. It's a nice family. Yeah. You see, she's from a family of six. I'm an only child, so we both feel that a big family's right. Yeah. Sure is quiet in there. You like me to go down and get some coffee? No, not for me. I don't want anything. Are we going to be able to take Helen to the hospital? That's up to the doctor, Alden. Yeah, I guess so. I guess it's up to him to say or not. Sounds like you're a father. Yeah. Congratulations. Same to you. Guess my troubles are over now. They're just starting. During the next few days, we got a dozen more calls. All of them proved false. However, during that time, the robberies continued. Despite our warnings, doctors continued to answer calls at hotels for people they didn't know. The amount of stolen narcotics grew larger. The outlet for the drugs still hadn't been found. On Friday, June 26th, we got a call from a Dr. Halbert. He told us that he'd gotten a call from a couple who gave their name as Alan. He asked us to meet him at the hotel. Well, how long ago did they call you, Doctor? About 25 minutes ago. Ask me to come right over. That's when they gave you their names, did they? That's right. Ever treat them before? No, new to me. Think they're the people you're looking for? Well, we don't know. The description we got from the desk clerk matches the suspect. I'd rather you wait out here. It'd be better if we went in with you, doctor. That may be your opinion. You're forgetting I'm a doctor. I want to help you catch the people you're after, but my first duty is to the patient. I'm not going to embarrass them by having police officers ask questions. We're here to take care of you, sir. Then do it from the hall. According to your bulletin, the man always locks the door, doesn't he? He has in the past. And that's how you can tell. He locks the door, then come on in. All right, that's the way you want it, doctor. That's the way it's got to be. All right, sir. We'll be right out here if you need us. I hope I won't. So do we. I'm Dr. Help. Why'd you shoot him? Dead. You killed him. We didn't call it, lady. How can you say that? You shot him in cold blood. He's just a kid. You didn't have to kill him. Better call in. Yeah. He was doing it for me. He was helping me and you killed him. He didn't know. He was just a kid. He didn't know what was going on. I told him what to do. I set it up. You come in here and kill him. I hope you're real proud of yourself, cop. Hi. Get 
tired of waiting at home. Decided to put in the time here. Glad you did. He looks tired, doesn't he? He always looks that way to me. You're getting prettier every day, Ann. Thanks, so are you. How's Faye? Fine. I don't know how you do it, Joe. What you see in you? She's got these reports out. We go home. Long day? Yeah. You do look tired. A little bit. When you get through with your reports, I'll buy you both a cup of coffee. That's the best offer I've had all day. I'll take care of the shooting. You want to get the dead body report? Two seventy six South Pixel. Two six seven. Oh, Joe. Nine two seven six South Pixel. Yeah. Can't remember the DR number. One two seven five four six zero. I asked you this morning. You gave it to me. What's the matter? I'm just tired. Here, buddy, I'll finish that up. I'm sorry I came down here, Joe. I didn't think you'd mind. No, that's all right. I'll drop these off at Homicide on the way. Hey, it's quitting time. You going on? I'll see you tomorrow. I'll take a rain check on that coffee, Ann. Good night. Good night, sir. How many are you going to smoke at once, Joe? I guess I am a little tired. How old was he, Joe? What? The person he killed. How old was he? Why do you ask that? I'm not a policeman, Joe. But I heard Creasy and Stewart talking about the robbery call. What Frank said about the dead body report and the shooting. How old was he? Twenty-two. The first time I ever killed a man. Mm-hmm. What a good thing, Ann. I kind of wonder if maybe there wasn't some other way. Was there? No. He called it. Joe. Yeah? There isn't much I can say. Nothing to make you feel better or make you forget about it. But, Joe, you're in a special kind of job. I've been telling myself that, but it doesn't seem to help much. Did he have a gun? Yeah. Did he use it? Yeah. Well, doesn't that make a difference? Doesn't it matter that the only reason they're not filling out a report on you or Frank is that you were better at your job than that boy was at his? Remember the time you and I sat in the hospital waiting for Frank to come out of it? Remember? Yeah. Frank and I could be waiting for you tonight. What's your rating on the pistol range? What? You get six dollars a month extra for marksmanship, don't you? Yeah. That's pretty good, isn't it? Is it? Joe, you could have missed if that was the way it was supposed to be. I've read where even a twelve dollar shooter misses sometimes. I suppose so. Joe, I don't know who made the decision. But I'm glad it's the way it is. Now, come on. I'll buy you that cup of coffee. All right. It's kind of 
dark. Can you find your way? Yeah. Can you? October 21st, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a term of not less than five years. A coroner's jury found that Edgar Cabell was killed while resisting arrest, and his death was listed as justifiable homicide. Look familiar? Look familiar? <laughs> it certainly should. I mean, look at that, you know, everything up to that first five note, that very famous first five note intro. Dun, 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 dun. You know, compare that with Law and Order. Dong, dong. You know, compare the opening narration with Law and Order. They have been ripping off Jack Webb for 71 years. Here's the trivia. It's not related to anything else, but you may find it interesting. I do because I'm a fan of Dragnet, and part of the reason I'm a fan is because Jack Webb, remember he was played Friday in this. He's also the creator of the show. If you look at the end credits, he directed it. He is oftentimes producer. Um, he created a shared universe long before Star Trek did it and long before the MCU did it. This shared universe consisted of a number of things. There was a Dragnet radio series that started and ran in 1949 all the way to 1957. There was actually one movie before that called He Walked by Night that we count as part of the Dragnet verse, but it really is kind of a baby Dragnet. Jo um, Jack Webb's in it, and you can tell where he got his influence for doing Dragnet from. But the radio series ran 1949 to 1957. There were then two Dragnet TV series, one that ran from 1951 to 1959. Many of those episodes are on YouTube. A lot of them are in the public domain. The one I just showed you came out of that series. I certainly suggest just, you know, Google Dragnet. I mean, you're not Google, but YouTube search it. You're going to find all kinds of stuff. There was also a series made from 1967 to 1970. Many of these are on YouTube generally in violation of copyrights, but they are on there. You can certainly watch it if you want to pay money. 
Uh, I particularly recommend the two hour pilot, which was made in 1966 before that started. Um, it's on YouTube. It has been here now for years. Uh, there's a link below. I don't think it's in any danger of getting a uh, copyright strike. It's unfortunate they pull it down because that one's really hard to find. There was also a theatrical motion picture released in 1954 during the series, which is also very hard to find. BitTorrent. Oh, excuse me. BitTorrent. Mm, pardon me. There's a couple of novels set in that universe. I have one of them called The Case of the Curious Killer, or Courteous Killer, rather. It's a great novel. There was then, after Dragnet, there was a TV series called Adam 12. Now, where Dragnet is about a pair of uh, detectives, you know, plainclothes detectives, Adam 12 is about a pair of uniformed patrol officers, and they drive around in their car and do uniformed patrol officer things. There was a TV series called Emergency, which was about paramedics and firefighters. There was a TV show called uh, The District Attorney, or DA. Well, guess what that was about? And there were crossovers. They did crossovers from these shows from time to time. Now, among those of us who like to think of ourselves as fans of the Dragnet verse, we also include some other shows, one of which was produced by Jack Webb and has an opening narration by him. And that's Project UFO, which was fictionalizing accounts of the Air Force program Project Blue Book, which, if you don't know, was a program where they investigated UFO sightings. Then there's two that are not produced by Jack Webb. He was gone by the time that they did these. But we count them as part of the Dragnet verse. One of them is the new Dragnet, which was a new Dragnet show. The reason that we can count this as part of the Dragnet verse is because it didn't use the same characters, but the same location, same locale, Los Angeles. So we say, eh, that's in the Dragnet verse. And then there's the new Adam 12. Um, also almost concurrent with the new Dragnet, not surprisingly. And we include that in the Dragnet verse again because it doesn't use the same characters as the original. And it's just set in Los Angeles. The interesting one. Those last two series aren't very good, by the way. Uh, they're police procedurals, but they're just not that good. The really interesting one, though, is an actual outright remake that we don't count as part of the Dragnet verse because it's a remake. It ran 2003 to 2004. Again, straight up remake. And the interesting thing about that is it stars Ed O'Neill as Joe Friday. And if you haven't seen Ed O'Neill in anything except Married with Children, where he plays Al Bundy, go watch this show. He is a remarkably good Joe Friday. I think that probably Jack Webb would enjoy him. The show did not last that long because by then everyone had been ripping off jack webb's police procedural format to the point where there was just nothing unique about that show um so all 22 episodes of that well they're on youtube um probably in violation of copyright but there is a link to a, to a playlist that has them all in it i would particularly recommend you know even if you don't really like police dramas and stuff watch the two episodes the artful dodger and I, I recommend that one because it's a really good detective story. And then the other one, The Little Guy. Um, that one is the best one of the series, I think, and it's just plain riveting. <laughs> so I guess that that's all I've got to say about that subject for today. So if you like what I'm doing, please do like, sub, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would certainly appreciate your support, either via subscribe star, my PayPal tip jar, or a place where you can support me on my website further. And there is a description to all three of those links to, to all three of those in the description box below. And so, thanks for watching Tales from SYL Ranch. And remember, for a breath of fresh air, watch Tales from SYL Ranch. News and commentary from the heartland. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing. The control and manipulation of minds.